I live in Colorado, and when my family moved here, we were all so excited to be living in such a new place, close to everything we love. I was outside all the time with my friends, exploring our little town. More than anything, I loved hiking up in the mountains. It was beautiful and so wild up here. And one day, while I was out on a hike, I actually ran into this little coyote pup. He had been caught in his leg in a trap. He was nervous and wasn't able to get loose without any help. This coyote pup managed to bite me, but not enough to break the skin. I was fortunate and able to help him get free from the trap. I've noticed too that coyotes are overrunning the place. They're everywhere. They're all over the towns and fields, you name it. They are. And it's gotten so bad that people actually have to keep their pets inside around here in this small little town. They're worried that these coyotes will get to them. At least where I live. What scares me the most is just how similar this coyote pup looked to a German Shepherd. Kind of like a wolf-dog hybrid. It wasn't exactly natural. Well, later on that evening, my family and I were driving in the car and we saw three coyotes. The way they looked was so weird. Extra shaggy fur, but also kind of mangy. Their fur was matted and dark. One of them, in particular, the leader, had long pointy ears and bright yellow eyes, looking completely different from the other two. It even stared directly into our car window at us. And not to mention, its face looked much different than a regular coyote's. It almost had a, dare I say, human quality to it. And I knew something wasn't quite right. Coyotes aren't supposed to act this way. They're supposed to be afraid of humans. And after the night of the drive, we began having these strange-looking coyotes appear all around our house at nighttime. They did things that really set me off into the land of terror. Standing upright walking around like a person would. They would walk around the house, howl and scratch along the walls and the door, and then disappear for the night. It was the most terrifying thing. And then things got even worse. One night, when I was walking out to the car in the parking lot behind a house, a coyote began growling at me, parking from behind some bushes. It came out running after me, but didn't attack. Instead, I think it was trying to bluff charge. When I told my parents about this, they were so freaked out, they immediately called my uncle, who lives up in Colorado Springs, a big city about an hour south of us. My uncle has been living there for years with his family, next to a huge open space filled with all kinds of wildlife, including, but not limited, to coyotes. He told them that these things that we have been experiencing is not normal especially for coyotes. We've been having these kinds of incidents for almost a year now. Another night, as I was leaving my house, I began to check out of my spot, and a coyote appeared at the front of my car's headlights, glowing yellow eyes looking directly into mine. It snarled, but never made any movement. Now, this coyote was standing upright like a person, reminding me of a werewolf. It was something like out of a nightmare. I didn't know what to do. And then it just kind of walked away into the darkness, disappearing for good. It has now gotten so bad that my family is afraid to come outside at night. And we've all been feeling this constant fear looming over us. And it's all gotten so bad that my family is afraid to come outside at night. We've all been feeling this constant fear looming over us when we leave home for anything. There are these things everywhere, and more of them as the days go on. They're multiplying like crazy. This has to mean more than just a coyote population that has clearly gotten out of control. There's something much more sinister at work here, and I know it. The only thing I can think of is that we actually have real-life werewolves, or where coyotes, or that these things are actually skinwalkers. Is this true?
I work for a delivery company, delivering food to different restaurants. Sometimes I deliver to fast food restaurants, and sometimes I deliver to nicer chain restaurants. Regardless, I reside in northern Florida for the most part, and 2019 has been a beautiful year. I was driving at about 2 in the morning, and suddenly I saw this strange bipedal creature thing standing next to the road. It just stood there, staring at me, and as soon as I saw it, my heart began racing. That creature would have looked terrifying to anybody who saw it. It stood about average height for a man, but kind of had a lizard's face, very big eyes, but it still looked human in some ways. I know that sounds unnerving. I'm not entirely sure what this thing was, but it made me so terrified that I couldn't stop shaking for the next half hour. As I approached closer, it kind of stepped back into the thicket. I drove by it, and it kept looking at me in the shadows with its bright yellow-green eyes. I can't believe how scared I was, but this thing was really frightening. As I drove past it, I kept realizing there was no way this could have been a person at all. It was clearly a bipedal animal of some kind. It was gross looking and had green eyes. It kind of reminded me of some sort of lizard man or something. I don't know. I didn't stop when I saw it. I was too petrified with fear and felt like if I stopped and confronted this thing, it would somehow have killed me. If there is any advice for somebody at your organization about how to act when seeing a cryptid like this one, Please, tell me what it is, so next time I end up seeing this thing, which is hopefully never, it won't kill me. My grandparents are originally from Africa, and we still have family over there. My grandmother especially loved to tell us stories all about her childhood growing up there, and all the adventures she would get into. She was still very close to a sister and her family who were still over there. The wonders of the internet. This meant they were able to chat and it was cute to see this amazing old lady gossiping away from her couch in the US with her sister, otherwise known as my great aunt, all the way across the world in Africa. When it was going to be my grandmother's 80th birthday, both she and my grandfather were still in tremendous health, despite their advancing years we decided to throw her a surprising party, inviting her sister. Not being in the best of health herself, my great aunt needed to bring her own son and daughter-in-law with her. But my father offered to pay for everybody, and it was settled. We were excited to actually meet the people we'd only seen via Zoom, yet heard so much about. One afternoon, not too long before the surprise event happened, I was asking my grandmother about the family, trying not to be too obvious but wanting to hear more stories about the people I would soon be meeting. As usual, she happily spoke to her sister and then made a strange comment. She confided that her sister wasn't happy about her son's marriage, as she could have been, that my great aunt was suspicious of her daughter-in-law and even worried about her son, whose health seemed to have taken a sudden nosedive ever since the couple were married. And before his wife, he was a strong man, huge personality, and a wide grin. Now he seemed withdrawn, tired all the time, and had lost a ton of weight. He often didn't come and see his mother for weeks on end, when they used to be so close before. This all seemed pretty sad to me, but what did I know about marriage and relationships? I was still in high school at the time, so I shrugged it off. The days before the party were hectic and stressful. So much to organize and needing to keep it secret. My great aunt's daughter-in-law, the one she was so suspicious of, had made life even harder. Insisting she bring a ridiculous amount of luggage, including an oversized trunk filled with God only knows what. When we picked them up from the airport, she was even quite rude about it, sitting it in the back with her, 
making the rest of us squeeze into the minivan, surrounded by bags. They were staying at our house since we had plenty of room. I also noticed immediately what my great aunt had meant regarding her son. Although I'd only seen photos, he always seemed a big, friendly man, and now meeting him in person, he shrunk, barely saying a word. It all came to a head that night of the party. My mom loves animals, and we have a house full, four cats and three dogs. Thankfully, all of them were super friendly, but in case any of the guests were afraid or allergic, the dogs got to stay in the yard, and the cats were taken upstairs. One of them, Luca, just craves attention, though, and was pouncing on anybody who popped up to use the bathroom for some affection. I had been busy helping everybody get drinks, providing grandmother with Kleenex as she sobbed happy tears at the wonderful surprise. Even though I was rushing about, I still noticed my great aunt's son looking worn out, and his wife kept disappearing upstairs. In the end, I followed her up, quietly so she didn't see me. I saw her slip into the room where they were staying in. Again, she displayed a rudeness despite us looking after her, and we had made it clear when she arrived that, although they were extremely grateful, they didn't want anybody entering their room during this day. She'd keep it clean and tidy. There was no need to go in. I looked around for Luca, expecting her to come rushing over for a cuddle, but she was nowhere to be seen. I peeked into my parents' room, and the other three cats were all asleep, piled up on the bed, but no sign of Luca. Then I heard a mewling sound. The very noise Luca makes when she is distressed, which is almost never since she is a happy and friendly cat. It was coming from my room. My great aunt's daughter-in-law was staying in. The one she had just gone into. I crept over, listening at the door, and I could hear Luca meowing, sounding in pain. I didn't care about being a good hostess anymore. I was worried for my cat, so I threw open the door and screamed. There on the floor was a lamba, a snake with a human head, the head of my great aunt's son, and the head was eating Luca. I had heard of this creature from the stories grandmother would tell, a powerful creature created by black magic, a witch doctor, made from the fingernails and blood and is intrinsically linked to a human counterpart. The person who had made it, in this case the wife, who was all along indeed a witch doctor, controls this thing and the human. They do her bidding no matter what. But when this creature gets tired and hungry, so will the human. She screamed it needed to feed, slamming the door and screaming in my face, if the cat isn't enough, I'll take you as well. Just as I was thinking I was snake food, the door flew open and my dad rushed in. He had took one look at this creature and shot it in the head. It turns out, he'd come upstairs to use the private half bath in his bedroom, heard the shouting and screams, grabbed the gun he keeps in his bedside table and rushed to see what was happening, thinking maybe somebody had broken in, hoping to steal something during the noise and commotion of the party downstairs. When he'd seen the monster on the floor, instinct told him to shoot first, ask questions later, especially as he saw the bloody half-eaten Luca hanging out of its jaws. Thankfully, the spell broke and my uncle came out of whatever trance he'd been under and he was able to confront his wife. There was nothing much they could do here. Could you even imagine telling an American cop that you'd witnessed an African mythical snake monster? with a human head. But as soon as they got back to Africa, he divorced her and never saw her after that. As far as my story goes, I understand that the way I'm writing it and even writing it to you will probably be passed along as creepypasta, but I'm sure many paranormal, scary events are written off as that too. Hopefully, you can believe something like this. I love any kind of extreme sports, 
I'm always up for the challenge. By day, I'm a firefighter, so I find things like mountain climbing and parachuting out of airplanes help kind of relieve some of the stresses and pressures of everyday work. It also means I'm fully trained in emergency medical procedures. So, oftentimes, people invite me along on their crazy stints in case of accidents. We've seen some beautiful sights, nature and all its glory, and we've also had some hairy moments, including a buddy of mine falling pretty far down a cliff edge. Thankfully, he managed to get away with just a broken leg and a telling off from his wife. But once in a while, we will come across something not so good or completely unexplainable. Again, being a firefighter, I've seen some real messed up stuff. House fires are bad, but car crashes are the worst. So my tolerance for blood and body parts is pretty high. Now, one thing I'm not fond of is small, enclosed, and dark spaces. So yeah, I guess you could say I have a mild claustrophobia. I can mask it during work. As soon as I put on the uniform, I'm on autopilot. No room for any fears like that when you gotta crawl into some tiny space to rescue an infant. But to raise the adrenaline to try and combat this anxiety, a buddy and I decided to go caving or spelunking for you professionals. Being inside a cramped, dark space where your footing could potentially lead to an accident at any moment is both exhilarating and terrifying. As with any extreme activity I've tried, including swimming with sharks, I was beginning to see why people who enjoy their hearts stopping at various moments to do this, when something in front of me moved, and my buddy, the only other person there, was behind me. Now, we were in full protective and safety clothing, including headlamps, so we could keep our hands free, and I spun in the direction of the noise. The beam from my helmet revealing a very tight tunnel not too far in front of us, and the distinct shape of a large form standing near to the opening. It looked to be as big as us, which could mean only one thing, a bear. Only I couldn't work out how it could be since we had squeezed ourselves through the cave mouth. A bear would be much more broader and way less flexible, and it would have to leave, else how would it feed? Whatever the thing was didn't like the light, and it made this horrendous skittering type sound. It then rushed close to us. Maybe it was so disorientated by the light, it didn't realize it was coming at us, rather than away, and turned into the tunnel, and was right then that we could see what it was. With the light from both headlamps, we could clearly make out that it was a giant lizard person. That is the only way I can describe it. When I first looked directly at it, I couldn't believe that even for one second, I thought it could have been a bear. This thing was indeed tall, but it was also skinny and very pale, covered in scaly skin. It stood on two legs, each limb long like a human. This all led up to a very lizard-like head, complete with the side eyes and a long snout with a tongue that darted in and out. It then made a chittering noise and we could hear footsteps coming from the direction of the tunnel ahead, and I just turned to my buddy and yelled, Run! I have no idea how many of those things were there. Maybe the acoustics of the cave just made it sound worse, but there was no way we were waiting to find out. We turned back and ran as safely as we could, not even stopping when he almost tripped. I managed to grab him and haul him back up, and off we went. Thank God, although the cave mouth was pretty small, we could see the light pouring through, and we were out. We didn't stop to catch our breath, though, collect our thoughts, or even bandage his hand that he'd caught on a jagged rock as he steadied his fall. We just ran, all the way to the truck, and drove away as fast as we could. I don't think we even spoke until we pulled up outside my house. We just looked at one another, and agreed to step climbing outside of caves and never go back inside one ever again after that.
Back in 2007 and 2008, I was staying in my uncle's ranch to escape a bad home life. The house was in the middle of nowhere, roughly 500 or so meters from a paved road. No streetlights or any other houses close around. Very few cars even passed by on the road. At the time, it was winter, so most of my days were spent inside watching TV when I stayed over. The closest neighbor to have livestock, really at all, would be about two miles away on foot and another mile into the woods, off-road. The ranch consisted of a two-story cabin. This is where my uncle slept, along with his wife and grandkids who stayed occasionally. There's a family room below the main level, two couches, a fireplace, TV, and a sunroom, which is where I would sleep. Luckily, with my uncle keeping the wood stove going, everything stayed pretty warm. Now, during this time of the winter, it hadn't really snowed all that much, and the cabin is surrounded by about 100 to 200 acres of forest, old pastures and trails, which in the spring and summer are a blast to explore. The large barns are not in use anymore. Most of the livestock was sold or taken back to my uncle's hometown, 20 miles away. One night, around late February 2008, I had fallen asleep on the recliner, unable to sleep upstairs where everybody else was, since I was binge-watching horror movies. It was about 3 a.m. or 3.30 a.m. I woke up, turned off the TV, and there was this strange light coming from outside. It caught my attention, and it was coming from the sunroom, which faced north, towards where the forest and pastures were located. The light shined in through all of our blinds, and made it very bright. It wasn't an outdoor security light. Those are green and shining at a lower angle compared to what this light I was doing. It was shining straight into the house. Now, the house is roughly only a hundred or so meters away from the woods, so you can make out shapes and animals pretty easily, but not details with top-notch vision. When I stood up, I couldn't see any shape or shadow being casted on anything inside, but I could see something coming from the south from the woods towards the house. And by the way, I did not disable any of our security measures when it came in that night. All the doors were locked pretty tightly, Plus, there's no way to get off the property without breaking a window or a lock. This was an animal, walking on two legs, which you can compare with how a man walks. But instead, with really long strides, more like running, faster than a horse's galloping. And it had to be at least six to six and a half feet tall from what I could tell. The whole time its head was pointed downward, not at me. I do remember seeing muscular arms, and they looked smaller compared to its size. The whole time I saw this, it was just moving towards the house, long strides, and then it got to about 50 yards away from me, and would have passed in front of the sunroom. The whole time this is going on, that bright light that was shining through the woods into our house was ascending up into the sky before it disappeared. I saw this thing lift its head up to look at me through the window. I still could not see its face. This is when I got a good look at its eyes. They were bright yellow, more like a moon or stars glowing, and they had slits for pupils. It was staring right at me, giving me this expression, and as soon as my uncle's dog began barking like crazy from inside the house, where everybody was sleeping, it stopped in place and just stared standing still. My body reacted automatically, grabbing a large kitchen knife where I kept close by. I still remember grabbing that specific knife. I always used it whenever I walked outside since it was my only weapon that made me feel safe. I knew I had to protect my family at all costs in order to keep this thing from getting in the house. I opened the door, gently closing it behind me and when I took my first step outside, the creature was gone, nor to be seen. I walked towards where it was headed, but couldn't find anything or hear anything. I know, I sound absolutely crazy for going out in the dark without a light, but 
being so pumped full of fear and adrenaline, and being ready for war. So I went back in the sunroom, put the knife back, and laid in the same spot, while staying awake for hours. This thing never came again. The light was gone. But had my family not been there, I would have chased it down until I killed it, or it killed me. When I told my family about what had happened, they didn't take me too seriously. I know, I sound crazy, but this was real. Just as real as the world around us. A few years ago, I had an absolutely terrifying experience that I will never be able to forget. I was 18 and a high school senior. I had just been accepted into college. To try and earn a little extra money for student living, i.e. beer, I'd taken on a delivery job on the weekends. It was all perfectly legal, but sometimes they had rush jobs, things that needed delivering ASAP, no matter what time of day or night, and these jobs always paid extra. So, I tried to pick them up as often as I could, and you could sometimes even make triple pay. It was late one evening during winter time, and I was hanging with some buddies when I got a message asking if I could make one of these particular drops. The address was a bit of a drive, but since I'd have to pass the local res on the way there and back, my buddy who lived on the res asked if he could come along, keep me company, and then I could drop him off on the way back. So we headed off to the depot, picked up the box, and headed off to the address. Despite being late and really dark, it all went swell, and before long, we were driving back towards the res, so I could drop my dude home. And that was when we saw it, sitting right in the middle of the road. It was around one in the morning, and as I said, the middle of winter. Total darkness out, except for my lights. But there, right in our path, was what looked to be some sort of huge bear. Only even the light of just a car. It did not look right. Like there was either something wrong with it, or it wasn't just a bear. Suddenly, my buddy shouted at me. Hit it! I was shocked. This dude who I'd known since kindergarten was the most gentle person I'd ever known. I'd seen him pick up a damn caterpillar off the path when we were kids, placing it carefully in a bush so nobody would step on it before he was telling me to hit this bear, which would not only injure it, if not kill it, but also risk our safety. What? Then he starts sort of almost praying, chanting, I don't know what to do for the best. I don't want to hit that thing or total my car, but I've never seen him act like this. So I'm freaking out and I put my foot on the gas. The closer we get to the bear, the more I notice that it looks really wrong, and also that its eyes are glowing. And I'm not talking about the reflection from the car's lights. They were red. Then, as if it realizes what is happening, it opens its mouth. I'm expecting to hear this almighty roar, but the sound it makes is 100 times worse. It's a scream. To start with, I think it must have been my buddy, because this scream is 100% human, but still chanting under his breath. It wasn't me. And then the bear screams again, and literally seconds before impacting, it stands up. It must have been close to seven feet tall, leaping out of the way, and I miss it. I slammed on the brake, skidding to a halt, and my buddy comes out of his chanting trance to shout, No, keep moving now! And as I look in the rearview mirror, I see the red eyes again. I had no trouble hitting the gas and speeding out of there. Only when we got to the res and into his house did he stop with the chanting. I respected him and his heritage enough to know that it had been important and to not interrupt. But now, I needed answers. What was that thing? Why had he wanted me to hurt it? And what was he saying? He wouldn't tell me everything. He said he wasn't supposed to talk about it, but gave me just enough info to inform me that it wasn't a bear we encountered, but something called a skinwalker. He told me I'd have to look up the rest online, but in a nutshell, 
it was a very bad thing. He insisted on giving me a small bag containing some sort of talisman. Again, I wasn't to ask questions or open it. Just trust him and keep it with me. Having since looked into it, I see why he was so afraid. But again, although I have so many questions, most importantly, did he know who it was? Our friendship means more than me breaking his trust or respect by trying to get him to tell me more about it. I've been that way a ton of times, but after that, I've never come across anything odd or scary. I went away to college that summer, so I see less of him, except when I'm back on breaks. But I always keep that little bag he gave me in the glove box and check if it's still there before I head anywhere. I have always believed in monsters. I was the kid that checked their closet and under the bed, thoroughly expecting to find the boogeyman. I'd hold my breath going past cemeteries, never stepping on the cracks on the sidewalk, and you couldn't have paid me to go near a storm drain. However, despite being fully on board and terrified by their existence, I had never actually seen anything. It was one of those things where you don't need to see to believe. You know a gunshot is going to hurt. You don't need somebody to come and shoot you to prove it. And this was the same for me. I knew these things existed and actually hoped to God that I was never even proven right. See, when I was a kid, my parents thought it was just a normal phase and I'd grow out of it. I was still avoiding cracks and drains as a young adult. People just labeled me as a weirdo. It was fine. I still sleep with all the lights on. And after what I saw that day, I have a very good reason to. In fact, it's a wonder I even sleep at all. It was a miracle that I ever went to that farm, but even though the things I fear that go bump in the night are very real, I still had a day-to-day -day life to lead, and of course, work to do. At my day job, which is a bookstore clerk, I met this guy Sam, who was a regular customer. He's very nice, and his parents lived on a huge rambling farm with lots of land and acreage. I told him I loved horses, and he'd even invited me out to see his parents for dinner. I guess it was sort of a date. It still wasn't great. He had really wanted me to come and see his parents' mares. I guess it was a date. I still wasn't great with that sort of thing. Anyway, I ended up at this amazing sprawling old farmhouse, full of acres and fields, and most importantly, a stable full of beautiful horses. We had a great time, and I was thoroughly enjoying myself as with these things. I hadn't noticed how late it had gotten. It was already dark, and I had a little ways to drive home. I was just about to say that I needed to leave when there was a commotion from outside. The dogs were barking, and the horses whining. Since his parents were away for the weekend, Sam was in charge of the property, and more importantly, the animals. So, he grabbed a gun, and we headed out into the yard, by the stables to see if there was something like maybe a coyote sniffing around and getting the horses all worked up. The dogs were out there with us, sniffling around and yapping, and suddenly, they went completely crazy, barking, snarling, and trying like mad to get out of there in the fenced-off area that we were in and out into the meadows and woods that lay beyond. Sam was yelling at them and apologizing to me, saying that he'd literally never seen them act like this, but he just assumed there definitely must be a coyote out there and the dogs were just being protective. Then, the horses started neighing and kicking their stall doors. It all began to feel super weird. I just wanted to get out of there, but also didn't want to be on my own. Sam was more focused on the dogs in the woods, looking for the so-called coyote, and all of a sudden, he gives a shout and starts shooting into the tree line. Despite my fear, I run over to see what's going on. At that point, nothing untoward had crossed my mind. There were many perfectly regular and legitimate reasons for things to happen on farms, and of all kinds, like possible predators that could come sniffing around. 
none of which were remotely none of this world. But I had also always known that one day, I would finally come face to face with an actual real life monster. And it seemed it was that day. Standing near the tree line, but close enough for us to be able to make out that its features were clearly that of a giant wolf. It was standing on its hind legs, which were bowed like an animal's, but it seemed fairly steady. It must have been close to six feet tall, if not more, and everything about it was sturdy, like it was always very well fed. Its dark fur was almost shiny. Despite the dark, I could even make out the whiteness of its fangs. But the one thing to really stand out, out of everything else in the dark, was the fact that it was standing up, like a person. Its eyes, which were glowing this bright warm red, like a hot poker that had been stoking a fire. Sam fired off several more shots and we watched in horror as the shells connected with this thing, but made no difference. It didn't even flinch, just stood there as if the bullets were nothing. Neither of us could understand what it was doing, and then it appeared to speak. It used words, but nothing like we'd ever heard before. This freaked me out even more than the eyes. The dogs seemed to understand, as they went from barking to trying to break through the fence, crying and rolling over into submission. We both looked back at the dogs and their unusual behavior for just a second, but when we looked back, this thing was gone. The language it was speaking was something you'd expect like a demon would. Phonetically, it sounded like guttural noises and kind of growling, a language I never heard before. But I would imagine if demons had their own tongue, that's what it would have been. The dogs got up, racing back into the farmhouse where we found them huddled together and cowering in the kitchen, shaking. The horses were unsettled, nickering and huffing, but no longer stomping about and did not calm down. Sam said he had never ever in his life seen anything like this or experienced anything close to this. He kept saying over and over that it just must have been a rabid wolf that he'd have to let the other farmers know and to be on the lookout. Now, I'm no expert in animal diseases, but this wasn't no case of rabies. At first, I thought it was a werewolf, but there was one important factor. It wasn't a full moon, and weren't werewolves supposed to come out on full moons? That left really only one conclusion, since the farm is an old Native American ground. This had to have been a shapeshifter, or a skinwalker. I've been telling my friends my story in hopes they might have answers, but even them, who have grown up around here, can't find an explanation for what it is I saw. I'm not a believer in religion or anything like that, so the fact that I would see something that defies reality kind of disturbs me, and I can't lie that I feel a little shaken to my core. Just about two months ago, almost to the date, I was sitting in my car after working a shift at a gas station. Oh, by the way, this was in eastern Arizona. I was sitting in my car. It was a little after midnight, and I was smoking a cigarette, getting ready to text my girlfriend to let her know I was heading over to her place. I'm looking out my windshield, kind of just staring off into space, lost in thought, smoking on my cigarette. Windows rolled down. You know how it is. The night was clear, and the moon wasn't necessarily full, but almost full enough that it gave enough illumination around me that I could see in front of me and around me. And I started to see movement, far away. Well, far away from my car, that is, but close enough that I could tell it was a person, hunched over, kind of walking on all fours, but not quite walking on all fours, hunched over like they were sneaking around. At first, it made me sit up in my seat and try to squint closer adjust my eyes to more of the darkness and to see what it was I was looking at. That's when I was able to make out, after just a few moments, that this was indeed a person who appeared to have animal pelts or animal furs all around them. It's almost as if they were sneaking around, trying to be stealthy, 
as if not to be seen. At the time, my car wasn't on, so if they happened to look over at me, there was no way they could know that I was even in the car. This person crouched behind a large sagebrush and stayed there for a while. I kept watching, wondering what this person was doing. And then the next thing I know, one of the largest coyotes I've ever seen came from behind the sagebrush and took off into the night. It was very weird. I don't know why somebody would be out here in the middle of the desert at nighttime, covered in animal fur, and then all of a sudden, a coyote comes out. It was pretty creepy. I'm talking Stephen King levels of creepy, and I know that shouldn't happen. I don't want to believe in people transforming under the moon, even though it wasn't a full moon into coyotes, but I can't deny what I saw. I didn't actually see them transform, but it's weird that they would go behind a sagebrush, and then the next thing you know, a coyote appears. Anyway, I know it sounds crazy, and like some made-up horror story, but it's what I saw. And afterwards, I texted my girlfriend and let her know I was on my way ASAP. I put out my cigarette and I didn't want to stay around any longer than I had to. Way back when, I was a preteen during the early 1980s. I was visiting some extended family that I had never met down before in New Mexico. They lived in a tiny village with a close-knit community, or what I would like to call a village, since I guess the concept of a village doesn't really exist in America. Anyway, I thought it was super cool to be able to explore a new culture that I'd never been exposed to before. I was from Pittsburgh, so it was basically the opposite of everything that I knew. Much more quiet, peaceful, welcoming, and so forth. However, a few hours after the arrival of me and my parents, our relatives warned us of what plagued the village during nightfall. Apparently, nobody in town went out after dark, or let their pets out after dark, because these creatures called skinwalkers would prowl the streets and possess whomever they could find. Apparently, these beings did not actually appear often, a few times a year at best, but when they visited, it was sporadic and unpredictable and nobody was willing to take the chance of stumbling upon them. Allegedly, one of the townsmen had tried to shoot a skinwalker with his rifle one night, only for the bullet to be deflected off of it and back into him, straight through his heart. After that night, the townsfolk knew they couldn't fight back and were best off being shut inside. I figured this was all an elaborate old wives' tale, just used on kids back in the day to keep them from sneaking out. And over time, the entire community eventually bought into it. Besides, being from Pittsburgh, I figured by then I had met people far scarier than anything I could find here. I mean, being 12 years old, I purposely snuck out the back door that night just to see if I would come across one of these things, even though I doubted I would, and I didn't believe in the story anyway. I passed the town's small library when I spotted something odd a few yards away from me, and it was then that I knew I was wrong. Across from me was a lanky, crouched over figure of what was shaped like a person, but had the external appearance of a coyote, with its hands and feet wrapped in what looked to be bandages. I screamed, running for my life, as the skinwalker bounded after me. Quiet except for the padding of their feet on the ground below them. I saw somebody's door open, and an older lady yelled at me to get in. I just about flew inside, and she shut and locked it, just as this thing, a skinwalker, made their way onto the porch. In frustration, it pounded against the door and let out grunts and screams of anger, before the noises finally ceased after a few moments. The scream sounded like a mixture of a coyote yelp and a person screaming. It was awful. The lady and I just let out a sigh of relief, and she asked me who I was and what I was doing out at night. I just explained to her that I was here visiting family, and that I wanted to find out if so-called skinwalkers were real. She told me that if you wish for them to show up and desire them, they'll make sure to be there, 
and that I was so foolish to tempt fate like that. She said I had been caught. The witch would have taken me far away, so it wouldn't have mattered how loud I screamed. Nobody would hear me. From there, it would have skinned me alive and disguised itself as me whenever it so pleased. Luckily for me, she deemed it not safe for me to go back out, so she had me spend the night on her couch. In the morning, I was reunited with my family, and once my parents found out what happened, they wanted to leave, but our relatives reassured them that it'd be a while before any skinwalkers returned. Nothing happened, and we went home a few days after that. I haven't visited that little town, aka a village, because it's so small, in nearly 40 years now, but that experience is still enough to make me think twice about going out at night. And if you're curious on the location, this was in Folsom Village in New Mexico, and there's a reason it's a village. It's a literal hole in the wall. There ain't much to it, but there is a very small populace there, and even less so back in the 80s. I have no idea what it looks like now, because I haven't been back there in a long time. But anyway, I try and stay far away from anywhere around there. You probably get some stories that just come across as too ridiculous to be authentic. Well, mine will sound no different, so I apologize in advance, but I spent a few months working at Skinwalker Ranch in Northern Utah. Yes, that ranch. I was one of the armed guards. When the army let me go, I didn't know what to do with myself, so I decided to start personally exploring the unknown. I hired on, expecting to see things more along the lines of UFO and sky phenomena. Believe me, I did, but what I saw the most was more earthly, and that was somehow all the more terrifying. They put me on patrol at the outer perimeter, close to the main gate. If someone without clearance put their hands on the gate, it was my duty to light them up. A man can get really self-conscious out there in the sun, where the heat will play tricks on you. I was three hours into my shift one very hot afternoon, when I saw the shadow of a tree shift. It wasn't consistent with the natural dappled sunlight created by the movement of leaves. No, the shadow of the entire trunk and branches was moving. I started to think that there could be somebody on the ground hiding in the long brush. So, I brandished my rifle, making it clear that I was armed so there would be no argument that they didn't know what kind of trouble they were in. I was sure I had made the right call when the shadow had stood up. What got me first was the eyes. They were like two white marbles that I could feel burning into me. They made me feel exposed and helpless. It was a very strange sensation, as I am normally fearless in conflict, if I do say so myself. I aimed my rifle at the figure and shouted at them to turn around and leave. The feelings I got from the stare became a nearly physical sensation, pushing me back, besides the fear I was already feeling. Before my nerves could make me pull the trigger, this figure shifted like a mass of oil into a shape. It licked its lips to show me its teeth that were white as its eyes, and it took off with speed that defies description. The shape it took reminded me of a puma crossed with a coyote, but was totally pitch black. It's beyond words. It would be far too convenient to say that I saw a skinwalker on Skinwalker Ranch. That's what everybody wants me to say or that it was a flying saucer, but that was no flying saucer, or an alien. Is there anything else that looks like a human taking on the shape of an animal? It really got under my skin in that moment, but looking back, it seemed so anticlimactic. No headdress, no morbid necklace of body parts, no animal pelts. But if a skinwalker's magic really does dehumanize them, may it make sense that it would be featureless, as if robbed of details that make an individual by its dabbing and dark forces. What do you think? Well, if you ask me, and take what I say with a grain of salt, because I know so very little, it's just another thing to add onto the great pile 
of all the strange and creepy things that happens around here. Was it a skinwalker? I don't know. Do I believe it was supernatural in some way? Or in some way demonic? Yes, I do believe that. I am writing with a terrible experience that happened to me in the fall of last year. Like many reading or listening to this, last winter seems like a century ago now. A world long before COVID and social distancing. I'm 34 years old and currently, or was a waitress based in Alabama before all of this happened. I grew up on the East Coast and only recently moved down here because that's where my husband's farm is. Since now that I live on a farm and being a mom, life isn't always exactly easy. But anyway, I work nights, or at least I used to, and the nights as you can imagine were slow. I was finishing my shift. It was around midnight and were open 24 hours a day, but there was another girl due to be in any minute to let me go home and end my shift. So I was sitting in our back kitchen, putting on some lipstick with a small mirror. Even at this time, we were preparing our lunches for the next day. So I decided I would go outside to the back alley and use one of the cars to apply my lipstick properly. It was one of the cooks. Him and I were very close and good friends, so I didn't feel weird about it. I could already feel that my face was funky, that I had blotched it. I'm a very proud person, and I won't be looking like a tramp. I realized before I do anything, especially leave my shift, I should step outside real quick and have a quick cigarette. I mean, after all, my shift was very stressful to say the least. I had a trucker come in and try to grope me from behind. That was a lot of fun. He ended up with a good smack across his face. But anyway, that's not what I'm here to tell you. I stepped outside had a cigarette, or at least started to light it, and as soon as I pulled out my phone, I began to feel something weird around me. I immediately turned my phone around as to shine the screen brightness into the darkness, when two large, what I can only describe as glowing orbs of light, what I can make out to be eyes shone from the reflection of the light of the screen. This was some sort of animal, some sort of creature, but everything was wrong. The head, it was like that of a skull, with large protruding eye sockets that seemed empty and lifeless, other than the fiery orange orbs that sit in them. It was horrifying looking. Whatever I was looking at was tall, but it was on four legs, just like an animal. In that very moment, I began to hear whispers, almost like a satanic chanting, almost. I really don't know what else to describe it as, but I immediately ran back inside before I could do anything. But as I stared at it before I ran back inside, it began to slowly come in my direction. Again, I didn't give it a second to do anything. I ran back inside, and I must have not even hesitated because I still had my lit cigarette back in my hand when I ran back in the kitchen. My cook, who was a friend of mine, yelled at me, asking me why I'm walking in the kitchen with a lit cigarette, and that I know I'm not supposed to be smoking inside. I felt sick, utterly horrified. He could tell something was wrong and came over to comfort me. I just began crying and saying something horrible was out there. He looked at me puzzled and confused, stuck his head out the door, looked around, comes back in and says, I didn't see anything wrong. I'm not sure what you saw. Are you sure you're feeling okay? I just nodded and he just told me that he would help cover me and I needed to go home. And of course, traffic was pretty dead, like I said, and the girl taking over my shift was about to be there any minute, so it wasn't a big deal. I don't know what it is I saw that night, but it definitely made me reevaluate what I believe in, and that there is such a thing as hell. My fiancé and I had traveled to Arizona, specifically to see the Beta Taquin Cliff Dwelling, a Navajo ruin carved into solid rock. We were showing up to do something where we specifically were not allowed to do. Delve into the ruins. We had contingency plans and everything, just in case we got caught. 
Long story short, we were able to venture off by ourselves and explore the many abandoned dwellings. It was when I had found a room that was connected to additional rooms that chained deeper and deeper into the rock that I got excited and called my fiance. She was outside and I could hear her feet shuffling around. She wasn't answering me and if there's ever a time that I'm impatient, it's when I found something I wanted to show her. I began to head outside when I noticed something while nearing the exit. The shuffling of my fiance's feet wasn't coming from outside. It was coming from deeper inside the interior. I remember my mouth going dry with another realization. The footsteps were coming straight for me. I looked over my shoulder once and only once, and another look and my sanity might have abandoned me. If it weren't for the eyes and the bared teeth, there wouldn't have been much to see. It would have just been a dark shadow wearing an animal pelt so old that it was withered into leather. A ruined headdress of some sort was on its head, and an almost covered two eyes that had the unfocused glare of a corpse. Whatever it was, it was meant to be human. But humans don't have claws like this thing did, or teeth as long as that did either. Neither do people have a growl so deep that it shakes your entire ribcage, and you could feel it in your sternum. It shouted a word at me. I don't know what it said, but I would later translate it to trespasser. I know that sounds incredibly cheesy, but I'm telling you exactly what happened. This didn't necessarily shout in a physical sense. I knew it was demonic in nature, because the way this communicated, the way it shouted was telepathic. I found my fiance, and she remarked at how awful I looked and asked me what had happened. I told her that I thought I'd run into a skinwalker, some sort of ancient demonic guardian. And you know what? The more and more I tell this story, especially now that I have typed it all out, I don't even believe my own story. This was back in January of 1997 when I saw the thing. I don't know exactly what you'd call it, but it terrified me, whatever it is. The thing is all I can use to describe it, because like I just told you, it was unlike anything I could ever fathom or imagine in my brain. Back then, I was a much busier man, with a younger family, constantly running around. At the time, it was my wife's 40th, and we spent the evening having a great dinner. At the time, we were at the outskirts of Maine. On the way home, we were driving through a road thick with forest on both sides. I'm talking heavily thick forests. My wife was pretty intoxicated after getting caught up with all of her family. So, the kids were at home with my mother, so I pretty much was just listening to the radio. But I kept noticing something white to my side, as if it was a white horse or something in the forest but every time I glanced over, I couldn't see anything. Something was catching my eye, and I didn't know what it was. I just figured I had been driving too much, and should probably pull over for coffee or something at the next stop. I kept brushing my hair out of my eyes, trying to focus on the road, watching my wife sleep with her head against the window. But I couldn't close my eyes for long, even though I was getting pretty tired. Before me, a large leopard-like white skeleton. I don't know how else to describe it. It was freaky looking. This thing was on all fours and jumped out into the road in front of me. I'd say about a hundred yards. I slammed on the brakes and tried to leverage my arm against my wife's stomach to prevent her from jolting forward. As the car stopped, with the engine still running, the headlights illuminated whatever this thing was. It was long very long, with the body of a white leopard-like looking thing, with a large hump on its back that stuck out with spikes or two bones, almost like antlers. It was very grotesque looking. It was almost like a hyena in how long its body was, and the way its back arched and its spine poked out. The best way I can describe it is imagine a skinned alive creature that's disfigured, I don't know what it was, I don't know what it was, but the overwhelming sensation 
of that I was about to die took over me. I have never felt such a sensation of evil before, ever. Where this thing supposedly had eyes were just empty eye sockets. It's like I was looking at a corpse, but yet it was moving around. I don't even know how this thing constitutes as a living thing. It looked dead, as if it was resurrected. That's why I believe this came from the pits of hell. There's no other description for it. No animal looks like this. My wife immediately woke up, and this sobered her up pretty quickly. She was speechless for a moment, before screaming and throwing her face into my lap, as if that was going to be a safe place. In that very moment, I immediately felt my adrenaline go from zero to 100 in that very moment, and I slammed on the ignition, flying towards the creature in hopes to zoom right around it and get out of there, since it was more on my side of the road and there was nobody else coming that I could see. Well, I was successful. In fact, right as I dove towards the creature and then around it, it actually jumped off the road into part of the forest or the ditch to the right of the road. The rest of the way home, I was pretty much so shot my nerves were, I was probably doing 20 or 30 miles an hour over the speed limit. In fact, it's only a miracle of God that I wasn't pulled over. I would have got slammed with a speeding ticket, hands down. I wasn't really sure how to cope or deal with a situation like this. I mean, who was I to even talk to? I knew talking to the police would have got me nowhere, so I didn't even bother. But anyway, that time has long passed, and my wife ended up passing away in 2010 from breast cancer. But one of our last conversations, when she looked at me with one of the most intense expressions on her face, she still told me she thought about that thing and feared that it will come back for her, or us, or our kids. And in my gravest of feelings, I knew what she meant, because for years I tried to suppress that horrible encounter. But it has haunted us, no matter how much we suppressed it, no matter how much we didn't talk about it. Whatever that demon was, she worried that after she died, this thing would come to take her soul. I wanted to send my story to you, because I believe that what we saw that day was 100% demonic. In no way, shape, or form could it have been a human or another creature of this world. You know as well as anybody that there's a lot of things out there that can't be explained. I feel like what I have to tell you falls into that category very well. So, I keep chickens out here in one of the most hospitable regions of Arizona's wilderness. I'm not going to give you a ton of backstory on my life, because I feel that it's not really relevant to what I have to say. But anyway, chickens don't really require all that much comfort. Give them seed and water, and a place to run, and they're happy. I've gone years without any issues with any predators. In fact, I even made my coop as secure as a prison, and only a desperate fox, or whatever, would try to get in. Something started getting into my chickens without doing much damage to the coop. It was doing it consistently, whatever it was, as if I had set up some sort of chicken vending machine out here in the wild. I wasn't going to have any such business, so I set up a trail cam to monitor the coop at night. Cameras don't lie, but my eyes had a hard time believing what they saw. First few nights went okay. But then I got good footage of the outline of a man with sloped shoulders coming up to the coop, and the birds got agitated like they knew who this was, and it wasn't good. I wondered how this guy was so good at getting to my chickens without leaving any blood or damaging the fence or really anything. I got my answer when the man would appear to be melted down into the shape of a snake and almost slithered its way into the coop, past all barriers without disturbing anything except the chickens. This large snake, the closest resemblance I can give you is that of a cobra, or so it looked like it, and appeared to be that. It clamped down on a hen head first, apparently trying to muffle the struggle, and slithered back out. Then it almost seemed to kind of form back into what a crouched man would be, and walked off with my hen by the neck. I'm no stranger to campfire tales, but I've always just heard them. I've never seen one. 
That side gave me a new fear that I found hard to deal with. That coop was probably more secure than my house, pound for pound. And here, I saw a shape-shifting thing on camera. Whatever this was, was able to slip in and out with perfect silence. What if it decided to come for me when there weren't any chickens left? Did, did I see one of those Navajo witches that turned into monsters? Or is this something else entirely? Whatever the figure was, was like a man that seemed to be covered in animal pelts, or what I can only best describe as animal pelts. In July 2004, near Gallup, New Mexico, I had my first and only encounter ever with a skinwalker. Before this, I used to say I'll believe it when I see it. Well, I'm a believer now. What I saw was not full human, nor full animal either. I was moving and had just completed the cleaning and was with my 10 year old son. We had called it a night and were headed to our new place. As we walked out the front door, I saw a figure move from behind my neighbor's car to a nearby tree that stood between our apartments. It didn't have red glowing eyes, snarling teeth or a rotten smell but it did move quickly, but not quick enough to avoid the light from a nearby light post and the porch lights. It didn't look at me or come toward me. It moved as if trying to avoid being seen. I was within 15 feet of it, but I did not look back to fully inspect it. What I saw was a wolf-like animal that sort of resembled the beast in Beauty and the Beast, just not cartoonish. It had brown fur that completely covered it. It wasn't a pelt. It appeared to be a very large wolf. It didn't have any human traits, except that it walked on its hind legs. It cowered behind the tree as we got into our vehicle. When we got in, I asked my son, Did you see that? Thankfully, he hadn't. My brother-in-law insists that it wasn't a skinwalker, because I would have never seen it. To this day, I can picture what it looked like, know they exist, and I pray that I never encounter one ever again. Back years ago, from about 2003 to 2009, I lived in a rundown, beaten down trailer park in New Mexico. It didn't have the greatest of residents. In fact, a lot of my neighbors were scumbags. And when I mean scumbags, I mean just evil, nasty people. People that would abuse the system, steal things, just scum of people. I don't like to talk down about people, but these, like I said, were just evil, nasty people. Unfortunately, I can't say much better about myself during that time. I was going through a pretty severe drug addiction, very toxic relationship, and I too fit right in with all the rest. It wasn't until around 2009 when I got rescued out of that and found faith in Jesus. Since then, I've turned my life around completely and now serve the light. The reason I'm writing to you is during my time there, what, five, six years? I believe I saw monsters. And no, they were not drug-induced hallucinations. Even though I was on drugs, they weren't the kind that make you hallucinate. And whatever this was, I had seen it. My girlfriend at the time, or my ex now, had also seen it. But they always seemed to gravitate towards the far end of the trailer park, where this old Navajo lady used to live. I always got the creeps going around there. Turns out that she practiced black magic, was heavily into the occult and witchcraft. I've only seen her a couple times, but even her face, her eyes were so sunken in, she looked dead. I don't know anything about Navajo tradition, nor do I know about occultism or really witchcraft, but I know enough that I've seen the trinkets she had around her trailer, the things that she practiced. It was enough for me to know what kind of person she was. The entire area around her trailer just had this ominous energy to it. It's like you just got the heebie-jeebies walking by it, and sometimes at night, looking in her window, we can see these terrible human-like shapes walking from the desert towards her trailer and circling. 
It was terrifying. It's like we were seeing the silhouettes of werewolves, or wolf-like creatures. I don't even know how to describe it. And because she's Navajo, does that mean she controlled these things? Again, I don't really know much about Navajo tradition, or what magic they practice. But I believe now, knowing what I know spiritually, that it had to be a massive component in what she did and how she did it. I live alone. I live off my own land, and I don't let anybody trespass on my property. I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. It could be OCD, or it could be something else. But it's my land, my rules. I woke up thinking that somebody was sure looking for a fight one night. The automatic light was kicked off by something moving nearby the house, and nothing triggers that light except something tall enough and large enough. So when that light was in my eyes, I was up and getting my shotgun ready to get an explanation. I did laps around my house, but saw nothing. I looked up and saw that something big like a buzzard was drifting real lazy, like around the moon. But that was it. There was barely any animal presence about that night, and no people for sure. So I just chalked it up to a glitch of some kind and went back to bed. I was woken by that light two or three more times before sun up, and boy, was I hot about it. I was yelling and stomping my feet on the dirt. Somebody was toying with me, and it wasn't funny. I couldn't figure out for the life of me where they were hiding. I didn't have hardly any trees, and none of them were big enough to duck behind. After three nights of the same nonsense, same light coming on, and same result of getting out of the bed, I looked up, and there, that big bird was circling the moon again. I shot at it in a fit of rage, and the body came tumbling down out of the sky. Except instead of crash landing, it transformed into something shaped like a human being with feathered headdress, just like an Indian. The eyes were glowing, and I'd never seen anything like it before. I think it could tell, because I saw craziness and laughter. It charged me, and I shot at it with the other barrel. When I opened my eyes, there were feathers drifting down, and I heard a crazy noise, like laughter or howling, like something you'd hear out of a lunatic asylum. But I didn't see anything. I'm honestly beginning to feel like I'm cracking up that I myself should be in a nut house. Am I hallucinating or is this real? Am I dealing with something supernatural? I don't even know. Anyway, I had heard my grandson listening to your show and I thought I'd see if my story might be good, if anything, to you. Do you have any answers or am I just a complete nut and having a mental breakdown? Because what I'm going through just seems so far-fetched and unbelievable that I have a hard time even believing and accepting myself without telling myself that this didn't happen. Is this normal? I live in Southern Colorado, and a long time ago, I had a project for my job, which took me to Albuquerque, New Mexico, for about two months. However, long story short, for reasons I don't really care to go into, especially since it's been decades at this point. I was let go from my job and had to go home after only three weeks. I was left with an over seven hour drive to complete in order to get back. My route would take me through the Navajo region and I didn't think much of it at the time. I had passed through it before without issue, albeit during the day. I had been driving for some hours by the time I got there and I really, really had to use the bathroom. However, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't seem to spot any sort of gas station. For some context, this was before cell phones or even GPS, so I didn't have anything except an outdated map to point me in the right direction. To my luck, which I would soon learn was actually my misfortune, I found a campfire going on in the distance from the road I was driving on. I figured I could just pull up nearby, 
ask the kind folks for directions to the nearest gas station, be informed of where that was, and then be on my way. However, when I arrived, I couldn't find anybody there. The fire was still blazing strongly, making it all the more puzzling. It was as if the people decided to abandon the place as soon as they saw my car. I heard something moving about the shrubbery a few feet away from me, and out came a wild sheep. Soon after, it was followed by a coyote. I didn't understand how the two animals could coexist peacefully together, given their predator-prey difference. They also acted bizarre. They were completely still and just staring at me, their eyes glowing from reflecting of the fire. To try and indicate I was friendly, I just gave a small wave and jokingly asked, where did the people go? I mean, it's not completely unheard of for people to catch coyote pups and domesticate them, so I figured that was the case, which would make sense while the sheep and coyote were hanging out together. But that's when I noticed there was something very wrong about these two animals. They were abnormally tall, their limbs reminding me of tree branches, and their torsos were too short and wide to make sense for either species. I began a bad feeling the more I looked and studied these creatures. I slowly backed away, and with every step I took, they seemed to take their own, crawling towards me, kind of like a cat getting ready to pounce. Then, one of them let out this horrendous scream and the fire, all in one, blew out, as if it were merely a candle. I yelled for my life and raced back towards my car, and once I made my way in, they gave chase after me, being very quick to be behind me, and slammed against the door as they just barely missed their opportunity to enter. I flew off down the road, the screeching of my tires echoing across the sky, but I didn't dare look back. I only stopped when I finally came across a gas station, hallelujah, using the opportunity to relieve myself and finally get something to eat. I was still paranoid though and got out of there as fast as I could. When I finally arrived home, I crashed on my couch. When I got in my car the following morning, I noticed it had human handprints on the windows. It only then dawned upon me that I passed through the native reservation I still think about this event from time to time, and I'm still relatively close to where it happened, so sometimes I have to drive through the area. However, if it's after dark, I don't dare do it. I just take the long way and go around the region. I'm honestly not ever up for having another experience like that again. That was more than enough for me. I have a very close mate of mine that just celebrated his 18th birthday just a few weeks back. And yes, we had a safe social distance birthday party, so to speak. But we had a very dreadful experience. I had gone back with him to have a fag. And for those that are in America, that means a cigarette, so don't take that the wrong way. He lives out in a village, or I guess out in the middle of nowhere if you were to put this into American terms. So, we're talking desolate, nowhere, surrounded by woods, and his village is very tiny, with not a lot of people around, especially out during the nighttime. But when we stepped out, this thing came out of the woods. I don't know how to describe it. It was like a demon or something. It had weird looking eyes, a long white body. It was almost skeletal, is the best way I can describe its details. It kind of seems slimy, but completely hairless. Its face nearly resembled a skeletal crocodile, and its eyes were large and yellow. My friend and I were frozen in fear. Immediately, I thought I should pull my phone out to try and get a picture of this thing. I mean, can you imagine the Snapchat story this would make? But then I thought, who would believe me? Everybody would just laugh at me and tell me great costume. Maybe the drink I was having was spiked. This thing noticed us and began hissing and groveling and pressing its slimy body against the ground, coming towards us. 
I was terrified, and so was my mate. This was like some sci-fi genetic experiment or something gone wrong. I wasn't quite sure what I was seeing, or he, but this was something terrible, something gruesome. It reminded us that something the government would try and cover up. And ever since I saw this thing, I've had the most bizarre nightmares. For whatever reason, it didn't pursue us, attack us, or try to kill us. After hissing at us, it quickly, as if being alerted to something, fled back into the woods where it came from. I know that sounds cliche, but somehow, I believe it was sparing us. Why? I don't know. We ran back inside, and that pretty much killed the vibe of our small party. I'm not really sure how to handle this new reality, considering I've always been the type of person to make fun of people for believing fairy tales, dragons, and all that nonsense. And now I've been proven that something other than this exists. My girlfriend even keeps asking me what's wrong and that I need to go to the doctor. It's really affected me. I often think now that I have the virus too because I break out in cold sweats. Or maybe it's just something that I saw changed me, taking me out of my everyday reality and reminded me that there are other things in the universe that I don't understand or perhaps want to understand. I hope that in writing this, other people will perhaps hear me and come forward and share their experience. My mate thinks it's a skinwalker. Whatever that is, I've never even heard of it. I don't know, but I hope to God that it stays the bloody hell away from me. That was terrible, man. It gave me nightmares and still does. I'm at a very low point in my life. I'm completely and utterly homeless and currently typing this from a library computer. I don't have any friends or family to crash with and my only form of shelter was the gym that I work at. Since it's open 24 seven, I used to sleep in the back rooms after I got off my shift. However, I was eventually caught and threatened to be fired if I did it again, leaving me with nowhere to stay. I can't even afford a hotel, which left me very desperate. About a week ago, I settled down with what little I have in the woods nearby my workplace. I chose them not only due to their proximity, but ultimately, their seclusion. At the time, I considered myself very lucky given that dense forestry is somewhat uncommon where I live, which is the southwestern US. I didn't want what little I had to be stolen. I didn't really have any issues with the first few nights. However, I was recently pulled out of my sleep to the sounds of something moving around me. I tried to figure out what it was, but I could only really make out what it was in front of me, which was the dim, buzzing lights from the back of the gym, a few hundred feet away from me where I was at. What I was hearing seemed to be coming from behind me. I couldn't tell if it was a human or an animal but I wasn't sure which one to be more paranoid about. I took out my crappy burner phone and checked the time, which read nearly 3 a.m. I turned my phone around and shone it into the trees nearby, trying to see what was there, but nothing. Not knowing what else to do, I gathered all of my possessions and laid on top of them, just in case it was somebody looking to steal them. It wasn't terribly comfortable, but neither was sleeping out in the woods. Yesterday morning, I hid my things to the best of my ability before I went to work. Upon returning to my stuff, I was happy to find it undisturbed. I set up camp for the night, and it wasn't long before I nodded off in a dream world. It seemed to be the same thing as last night. I flipped my phone open again, once again being three in the morning. I knew this was going to drive me insane so, I used the light of my phone to look around again and got out of my blankets and weaved around the trees a bit. Eventually, the light shone upon something. It didn't appear to be human nor animal, but a disturbing combination of both. Oddly enough, it also looked to be a combination of alive and dead. I then came to discover that it was in fact a crouched over human wearing the pelt 
of what appeared to be a bobcat. I didn't try to talk to them. I didn't even scream. I just turned around and ran until I was back inside the gym. My coworker asked what was going on and I explained it to him. He didn't really seem to understand but was nice enough to let me sleep in the building for the night and promised to not tell our boss. Which brings us to today. I'm not sure what to do from here. Part of me is too exhausted to try bothering to move again and is hopeful that if I just leave the person alone, they'll leave me alone too. Another part of my fear is that it's only a matter of time before I'm skinned, just like the bobcat they were wearing upon their back. I know, I'll make a decision eventually, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Before I tell you this information, I'm going to just ask that you keep my credentials anonymous for my protection and for my safety, since if my name is exposed, I don't even want to imagine the repercussions. I used to work alongside the Albuquerque police, not exactly for the police, but I worked in conjunction with them. Again, it's hard to explain, but it might be better that way. Anyway, I know people talk about skinwalkers and them not being real, but there's more that goes on out in the desert than you would imagine. In fact, many of my friends who are officers all have their own terrifying stories to share, many of them unexplainable and paranormal. There was a case years back, back in 2004, of a man who supposedly had murdered his girlfriend. He claims, and apparently went crazy after this incident and being interrogated, he claims that a skinwalker had taken his girlfriend and skinned her and wore her skin to be her. Now if that isn't crazy, I don't know what is. We've gotten people who are hopped up on meth and LSD that can come up with more coherent believable stories. But his story never changed. His details, everything checked out, which is why it made it more terrifying. He claimed that him and his girlfriend went to some Navajo flea market in which she showed several of the vendors pictures of the skinwalkers and asked about it. She was faced with repercussions apparently and somehow, going by what he said, attracted a skinwalker in which she had showed up missing. Now, I don't know if I believe any of that, but I believe he had something to do with her disappearance, that he had something to do with her murder. Next thing you know, an officer had caught him at a local abandoned gas station far out of town and was apparently wearing her skin, wearing it like a suit, like it had been carved off her body. I know it's horrifying and very grotesque. He was detained and arrested on the spot and interrogated deeply about where he had hid the rest of her remains. He didn't say where and he stuck to his story about what had happened. Again, crazy stuff happens out here. Who knows if he was a skinwalker or his girlfriend was a skinwalker or a skinwalker got his girlfriend or he was possessed or maybe he was just high as a kite. This was a pretty normal 20 year old kid who had a pretty good track record and wasn't into mischief at all. So who really knows? It's another mystery in the paranormal files. I don't want to give away too much, but I thought you might find this interesting. Stay safe. Please don't hate me if this is not a skinwalker that I'm talking about. I'm not 100% sure. I am just really scared about this experience and it has haunted me ever since. I'm so scared that somebody I know will find it and I don't want to be judged. So sorry if this is a little long. Anyway, my dad lives in Spain, about an hour away from Barcelona. It's right near the beach without too many tourists. There are many mountains with small villages. My dad lives in a small apartment complex with a pool on one side of a mountain. When I visit him, my room is the only room facing the mountain, along with other apartments, of course. The blinds don't work, and I don't like sleeping with a completely dark sight into the forest or mountain area. So, I sleep with a blanket covering the window. There are small holes on the sides of the blanket. The kitchen faces towards the mountain as well. One day, when we got home from the airport, 
since my dad was picking me up. My dad went to the kitchen to get a drink, and when I went to my room to unpack. Suddenly, my dad calls for me to come to the kitchen, and I hurry. Right below our window is what looks like a wild boar. I'm not really sure. It is kind of covered by plants and leaves from the trees, but we can see what looks like a big pig, except it's much more hairy. My dad then throws that it's a rather large sausage, but it gets scared and runs away. Later that night, I go to the kitchen and get a late night snack. My dad is already asleep in the room next to mine. I look out the window to see if there is a boar, which it isn't, but the sausage that he threw earlier is gone. The high grass and plants that were there before have been pressed down to form a circle, kind of like field markings by aliens, except it's not aliens. I then go back to my room to hang up my carpet over my window. My back is turned towards the window to pick up the blanket as I hear a soft knock on the glass. I swing around quickly to face the window, but it's pitch black. I am a very paranoid person and have read thousands of creepy stories, and I am absolutely not one of those people to go investigate. So, immediately, I throw the blanket over the window and go to bed. I wake up a couple of hours later to somebody crying. It sounds like a dog whimpering. My neighbor has three dogs, so I figure it's one of them. I take a quick glance around the room. Nothing unusual, but I still have this weird feeling. Look towards the window, and still nothing unusual. That is, until I lie down again, facing the window, and look out one of the small holes to see two eyes looking straight at me. I nope out of there, and run to the other balcony facing towards the beach, away from the mountainside. I get some cool air and just relax a bit before going to sleep on the couch. The couch is facing the kitchen, and I can't help but look out the window. There is nothing. I relax a bit and close my eyes, though I don't sleep the rest of the night. The next morning, my dad wakes me up and asks why I'm sleeping on the couch. I mumbled something about being scared, and the conversation slowly glides to a stop. We decide to get a group of friends and go hiking. Among the group of friends is a boy my age 16 who is a complete D-bag and always is really annoying and mean. I'm even reluctant to not want to go on this trip because of last night's experience. But my dad forces me and I end up tagging along as the last one in the back. We have walked for a couple of hours and I suddenly start to feel uneasy. The boy my age, we'll call him John, notices and walks over to me. John asks if I'm okay, and I answer yes. He says he had the weirdest experience last night. They too live in the same building, and his room also facing the mountains. He tells me about this weird feeling he had, and his dogs wouldn't stop whining. I figure the sound I heard was them start to think it was all in my head. He then says he saw something in the shape of a human, but a bit taller, standing on the balcony that I have to my room, where, if you stand there, you can look directly through my window into my room. I stop, and my blood runs cold, on the verge of crying. As I said, I'm very paranoid. I ask if he's kidding me, because it wouldn't be the first time. He knows how paranoid I am, and he swears even though he's annoying, he's trustworthy at least, and I can tell when he's lying. I decide to tell him about my experience, and he spends about 10 minutes just cussing and saying stuff like, wow, wow, shut up, no way. I realize we are far behind and can't even see our group anymore. I don't know this mountain, and we decide to walk back and call my dad when we get home, since there's nothing else we can do, and we'd rather not get lost. Walking back, it's getting dark, and now I'm getting scared. He assures me everything is okay, and I realize he has changed from his douchey act to a much more serious demeanor. Suddenly, I catch a glimpse of something tall walking right beside us, 
and I spin around to face it. Words can't even describe what I saw, and I'm getting chills even writing this. The creature quickly ran away, but I saw a little into the bushes, and what was hunched over appeared to be a six-foot-tall human-looking thing with light hairs all over its body, long hands. It freaked me out. I know my description is terrible, but it's what I saw. I scream, and John looks over, and only catches a glimpse of it too. Still not sure what he saw. We were about half an hour away from our house, and we run the rest of the way. Now I immediately call my dad and tell him what we saw. He says they were wondering where we were, and tries to calm me down by saying things like it's just your imagination. They send two men back because the one of them had a panic attack. And my dad later told me that he had one because he saw what we saw. But my dad couldn't tell me that at the time because of my state of paranoia. We wait for the two men to get back. We locked all the doors and windows are covered up and lights are out. So we sit down and watch a movie. John is really nice now and calms me down. We hear a knock at the door but I convince him not to open it, since the two men have the keys. The knocking increases, and the sound is unbearable after two straight minutes with knocking. So, John opens the door. I stood behind the door, leading to my room, hiding. John yells that there's nobody, and I get extreme goosebumps. I feel like somebody is watching me, and turn towards the window and rip the blanket off. And there... Standing on the balcony is the thing, and the only thing separating us is glass, which you could easily break and just walk in. John comes running and tries to get me to go away from the window, but I'm frozen and crying, nearly peeing my pants. The thing then screams an inhuman scream. To me, it sounded like fingers on a chalkboard. It jumps over the balcony and then it's gone. All of this happened in less than five seconds. I still don't know what I saw, and John says he didn't see anything, even though I could tell he's lying and he doesn't want anyone to know what he saw, which only makes me look like a freak. My dad and the group eventually come home to find me huddled in John's arms, crying hysterically. Turns out the two men had just walked to the beach to get beer to calm the one with the panic attack down. I'm not saying what I saw was a skinwalker. It was just the first thing that popped into my head when I had to describe it. If I would have to say that it was, it would be a skinwalker or the werewolf from Harry Potter where the teacher turns out to be a hairless werewolf. My dad's girlfriend moved out a few months after complaining that she couldn't live there anymore and not saying why exactly she couldn't. I'm sorry for such the long post, but I'm not exactly sure what this could be. I want to say Skinwalker, but I could be wrong. I'll let you be the judge. A couple of years ago, my fiance, who was my boyfriend at the time, had his sister invite us to her wedding down in San Diego. We're from New York City, so at first we had the idea to just catch a flight. But then I was struck with a fun idea. I brought up how we could leave a few weeks early and take a leisurely road trip instead. So, by the time we arrived in California, we could take a few days to rest and recharge before the ceremony. I had never really been outside of the East Coast, so I was excited about the idea of being able to take in new sights. You wouldn't be able to see much from 30,000 feet up in the air. After some discussion, we decided that if we were to do such a thing, it would be most convenient to rent a car and return it upon our arrival instead of just taking our own vehicle. From there, we would simply take a flight home, sparing us from having to take the time to drive all the way back. So, when it came time to leave, we got our rental car, packed our things, and did the standard routine check of making sure the stove, oven, and lights were off, and being sure that the house was locked and left. 
most of the trip went as expected. We had our fun days of stopping in different destinations, like Indianapolis and St. Louis, visiting the multiple attractions they had to offer, and our not-so-fun moments of getting caught in heavy traffic or having to stay in a hotel that was a bit beyond our budget. Regardless, it was pretty cool to be able to experience things I had never had the chance to before. Overall, things went pretty smooth. That is, until we hit New Mexico. It was nighttime, and we ran over something. I'm not sure what it was, but it was enough to cause one of our front tires to pop, and the car was practically bouncing from the roughness that ensued. We pulled over, and went to check out the damage. The whole tire was practically shredded, hanging onto the car by a thread. We went to look for a spare tire, and my heart sank as we soon discovered that there wasn't one. The service nor data wasn't very good out where we were, leaving us next to stranded. The good news was that the GPS attached to our car used satellites instead of cell towers so it was still operating just fine. The bad news was that it used the car as its power source, so it would be rendered useless if we took it out. My fiancé then had an idea. He took out his phone and opened the notes app and copied the directions to the nearest town. It was about five miles out. Upon getting there, we could hopefully find a place to stay and have enough service to call the rental company let them know about the car and see what we could do from there. We wanted to wait a bit before doing that though, just to see if we could flag down another car to speed up the process. After about 15 or minutes or so with nothing, we decided to make our journey on foot. Both of us were very nervous about leaving so many of our belongings behind in the car, but with how much we had packed, it was impossible to take it all with us. We locked the car, of course, but that didn't mean it was impossible for somebody to shatter the windows and haul our stuff out, including my dress and his suit, both of which were rather expensive. A few minutes into our journey, I can make out the silhouette of a man running some distance away. It was late, but considering I was with my fiance, I wasn't exactly scared. I figured it was just a late night jogger, although I couldn't understand why he chose to run across the land instead of by the street. Then he turned around and the new angle allowed me to see something trailing behind him. I squinted my eyes, trying to make out what it was. It wasn't until then that I noticed how bizarre his face shape was. It was much more rectangular than I'd ever seen on a person. I had to ask my fiancé, What is that? From beside me. I told him I didn't know. My best guess was a strange looking person. The man only seemed to be getting closer, and I turned on my phone's flashlight. I gasped as the light caused the man's eyes to reflect back at us. Then... I was able to see his form in its entirety. Its frame was at a bit of an obtuse angle, with the bumps of its spine sticking out like spikes. Its arms were significantly shorter than its legs, and its hands only appeared to have four fingers, with long, sharp, black nails at the end of each one. Its face resembled that of a person's, but it was so bizarrely shaped for being such that it was practically uncanny. Its eyes were like that of a snake's, and I soon realized that the thing had been trailing behind its body was in fact its tail. It had no skin. In fact, it appeared to be covered head to toe in dark green scales. This creature hissed at us, revealing a long snake-like tongue that was previously hidden with its mouth. My fiancé and I ran, screaming and yelling for help as we did. This thing paced itself behind us, continuing to hiss and snarl. Some distance below, I can make out the lights of a small town. However, 
we were too high up on the cliff we were on to safely navigate our way down. Instead, we had to keep following the road, which wind down into the city, and who knew how long that could take. I then thought of something. I stopped in my tracks, picking up a few rocks nearby. My fiancé asked what I was doing. I turned around and threw one at the creature. The first one missed, but the second one hit it right in the forehead. It made a noise of pain and stopped briefly, shaking its head. My fiancé and I continued running, but this monster only seemed to be even angrier. It picked up its pace, and it wasn't terribly fast, but neither were we and I had no idea whether or not we had enough stamina to outrun whatever this was. Once we were nearly down the cliff, a car had driven past us, loudly honking its horn as we were far too close for his or her liking. The creature screeched and ran off somewhere to the side, but we continued moving forward. It didn't seem to follow us anymore, but we weren't going to take any chances. As we neared the entrance of town, we finally allowed ourselves to catch our breath. We walked into a nearby McDonald's, got ourselves water before anything else, and then sat down in one of the booths, taking a minute to try and piece together what had just happened. My fiancé tried to lighten up the moment by reminding me that we, in fact, did end up making it to our destination. We tried calling the rental company, but we just got an automated message that their offices were closed for the night and that we needed to call back in the morning. Not knowing what else to do, we walked to a small hotel and rented a room. We were exhausted, and despite what had just happened, fell asleep easily. It definitely helped that we had each other. The morning after, we called the rental company before anything else, they said that they would send out a tow truck to get the car fixed and that we could pick up the car in town later that day. We checked out of the hotel and went back to the McDonald's and had breakfast. My fiancé says the closest thing he could find to what he saw was a chupacabra. But even then, some depictions made it appear as if it were a dog or coyote-like creature, not a reptilian-looking thing so we were left pretty stumped as to what the hell it was. Whatever the case, I was just glad it wasn't after us anymore. We spent the day wandering around the town as we waited for that call if our car was fixed, but there really wasn't much to see. When we finally received the phone call, we picked up our car and made sure everything was still there. When it appeared to be fine, we stopped by a gas station to pee fill up the car, and get some snacks. When we were ready to get back on the road again, both of us let out a little laugh as we realized that we would have to return to the same place we were chased down in order to get back on track for San Diego. Upon our return to the road, I swore I could see webbed footprints lightly imprinted in the more sandy areas of the terrain. But I just shook my head and let myself relax putting my feet up on the dashboard. The rest of our trip was fine, and we managed to make the best of it despite what had happened. By the time the wedding ceremony came around, we found ourselves telling the tale over and over again to different groups of people. A lot of people didn't take it too seriously, as to be expected, and to be fair, neither did we. Pretending it was just something stupid made it easier to cope with, I guess. A lot of people brought up the chupacabra thing, just like my fiancé did, and others joked it was somebody from the town trying to scare away the tourists. You know, the whole Scooby-Doo thing. We eventually flew back to New York, and it never really came up beyond that point. After all, we had other things to attend in our lives, like our jobs and social events, Still, it wasn't long after before my fiancé proposed to me, and I do think that event, along with the inspiration from his sister's wedding, played a heavy role in his decision to do so. Maybe I'm reading a bit much into it, but to me, 
It symbolized that life could throw all sorts of crazy stuff at you, and that if you could handle such an intense experience with a person you love and make it through okay, then the two of you could take on anything. Things like bills would be nothing in comparison to what we went through. Anyway, I have never returned to the Southwest region since, and I don't really plan to. I'm not exactly scared of stumbling upon that reptile man again, considering it was in rural New Mexico, and I don't exactly have a reason to go back there. Still, it makes me wonder what other kinds of creatures are out in the world, waiting for unsuspecting victims to come across them, perhaps even where I reside. Whatever the case, I'm just glad I live in a place where there aren't many reptiles or reptile men.